Good morning, everyone. I've decided to um, put the little mirror trick on today so that you can see me and hear me. So i um, be interested to see what you think about that. Um, I've got headphones and a hat, just so it looks a bit better. Who knows? Um, so let's just get some level set. Uh, da, 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 da. That's the um, microphone. Pop, pop, pop. Turn it up a bit. One, two, one, two. Testing, testing. One, two, one, two. Hello, Philip. Hello, Patrick. Thanks for dropping in again. It's always uh, good to have familiar faces. Just sorting out my headphone cable here, which is getting a little annoying. Hi, Marie. So, um, as you saw from the little blurb, uh, thanks, Laurel. Yeah, got it for Christmas, this hat. It's pretty good when you're out in the wilds, keeping the sun off your face. And what I really need for Australia, of course, is corks. So, next week, perhaps, I'll put some corks dangling around it and then you won't be able to see me again. That'd be cool. So today's little session, once I've sorted out this headphone cable, so it's not flopping around, um, is what I'm calling Analog 8, which is basically two Analog 4s and set up to be a really cool workstation. High inverted popes, IP, uh, and by that I mean obviously one analog four. You've seen me do lots of jams um, using that. Basically, it can be a drum machine. It can be a, some play chords. It can play sequences, bass lines, and so on. But having two of them gives you a lot more flexibility. I actually um, did. Um, let's turn my headphones down a sec. I actually did a recording using two analog four mark ones almost 10 years ago now, so I've been sort of fiddling with this setup. It's not the one I use sort of all... Oh, get my microphone on axis. It's not the one I'd use um, all the time for jams. You've seen me use modulars and volkers and things, but um, I got these two really just to give me some sort of flexibility when I'm putting ideas together. And that's kind of what this morning is, really. It's to go through... The, these two as um, generating ideas and then sort of going into a performance. So it'll be the same process as, as before uh, in terms of going through some techniques and then going into a performance um, until I kind of lose interest or everyone drops off to sleep or the audience drops off. Uh, we're graced by um, Tappy down here who's uh, the, uh, one of the Yodas, one of the baby Yodas today, or Grogu's, depending on how Star wars EU you are. Uh, so, a little... Don't do that when I'm speaking. Naughty. Um, so, what, what I'm going to kind of do is set up each of the tracks on the two Analog 4s here as a performance set up, show you a few little performance tricks and then do a performance and by all means ask questions about anything I'm demonstrating, anything I'm doing. Uh, so one of the first sort of things I do is think about the arrangement, what I want to do and generally I'll, I'll go for um, some you know bass, drums as usual, couple of sequences, perhaps some chords, some effects, every track having a different thing. So at the moment it's pretty initialized. So that is, um, let's make sure you've got uh, volumes on that. By the way, you'll hear the rather annoying clicking of the analog four keys. And especially on this gray one, the um, I've had problems, I've actually sent it back. Uh, once to try and get it aligned some of the keys are not aligned with the holes properly so they sometimes stick a bit 
and it makes the noise even worse. He talks back. That's scary. Yeah, he's a uh, he's, um, cheeky little thing. Go on, say hello to Philip. He, that was translated as hello, Philip. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, the key, you'll hear the clacking of the keys if I turn down that. That's um, one of the rather annoying things of the analog fours. If you're using microphones like I am, you'll hear the tapping. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, so setting this up for a performance. And um, the other thing with having two analog fours I mentioned in the blurb is um, they are they can be polyphonic. So I've set the grey machine here to be in polyphonic config mode so that any note can play four voices simultaneously. And this one I've set into non-poly config, so each of the tracks here can only do one monophonic um, track at a time. The advantages and disadvantages, just briefly. The um, so when you're in polyphonic mode, I can take a sound, and that's that's not a, a sound design sound. That's just a basic one. I can play up to four notes. If I play five, it will steal one from lower down. So it's only playing four. If you've got lots of active tracks in a polyphonic config mode, you'll hear lots of stealing. But having two of these means that I can, for example, dedicate one to some chordal things and then another to some uh, other sort of more monophonic things. So I'll probably use this one for like um, bass lines. And tell me if I need to turn, to keep an eye on the levels, might turn my voice down slightly. Um, dedicate this one to sort of bass and sequences and effects, and this one to polyphonic, and probably um, drums, because drums are not using a lot of voices, um, particularly because they're only sounding partially, so the chords tend to sound like they continue over them. Uh, so let's start with, let's say, a bass. Uh, one of the tricks, performance tricks I like to use a lot is infinite sustain, um, which is great for ambient stuff. I can just get that bass going continuously um, while I sound design it. So I'm just going to add in a second oscillator, some big deep bass, a bit of filtering, so this is on a low pass filter and apologies I like to set this up with multiple cameras so you can kind of see in detail what's going on here but I'll try and explain it as I'm going through. So this has got a low pass filter which allows me to obviously just pass the low frequencies through and which is great for a bass. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do in performance mode is have the LFO over here um, adding some rhythm. So on the second LFO, there's two LFOs with two destinations each, which is pretty cool. I can control the volume of this. And it's on a um, sawtooth wave at the moment. Not sawtooth, yeah, yeah, or a shark fin type wave. So it's um, triggering at the tempo I set here on the speed for the LFO so and it's um, it's actually affecting the volume so it's basically turning the volume up and down creating that that pulsing effect which is great for when you're performing because you can change change chords um, completely in rhythm if you want it to stop you can quickly get rid of the release so infinite sorry I said infinite sustain infinite release I meant and then you can bring it back. So those those LFO tricks are really cool. Um, the big disadvantage, and I'll show you by bringing in just a, a bit of a metronome thing on our track four down here. Uh, let's just have a simple kick drum. Stop that. So I'm going to use track four for this piece as a um, rhythm track and I've got this set up at the moment to just turn it down a bit. Whoa, it's 
cloud. So I'll just use that as a metronome. Uh, sorry, the disadvantage of using the LFO is that even if it's in triggered mode, which means when you, well, when you press it, the, the moment you press it, that's the start of the LFO cycle. So, so that's kind of cool. But you notice there that second note I hit was out of time. So you have to make sure you hit things in time. Let's, make this, uh, let's find out what was too loud here, probably the bass. And the way around that is to put, say, a root note in. So I'm going to put this into um, step record and just make sure I've got a a note at the start of each bar. So that note there means that it's always going to trigger just the right moment. So even if I mess up up here, it's always going to go back in time. Um, the other advantage, no, disadvantage, I think that note is always going to return to the root. So when you're doing um, chordal changes, take your finger off, it's always going to return, so let's say I want it to go to a B-flat chord. If I take my finger off, it's going, it's going to return to the C in that case, but you know, we'll work our way around that. Um, you'll probably see as well, as I'm in performance mode, I'm constantly, um, in the case of these infinite release sounds, I'm constantly turning down the levels as opposed to muting the track because muting the track in infinite release by muting I mean turn it off which is that note it still continues the note because it's in infinite release so I tend to in performance mode just do a quick mute I could set some things up there in performance mode but I'm not for the moment um, what was that noise um, the next thing, so we've got a bit of a bass, I'll leave this metronome going just in the background, so we've got a beat, is uh, chords. So this grey analog 4 is in polyconfig mode, so I'll show you again, everything's checked yes, so it's basically saying any of these four voices, strat slash tracks, can have a monophonic, uh, sorry, a polyphonic configuration. So, so track 1 here, I'll explain where the sounds are coming from is in poly mode. So again, I'm going to use, while I'm sound designing, just quickly put that into infinite release. So when I press it now, it'll continue. And which allows me to do things like turn up the second oscillator. I'll just turn off the, um, turn off the drum track. And you can hear there's, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a bit of an envelope attack on that one, so I'm just going to... Turn up the second oscillator, a bit of detuning. four note chord, bit of filtering. Um, one of the other tricks I do when using analog fours, and you know, I have got a digitact and uh, model cycles, both electron as well, which I could use with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Just gonna have a drink. <coughs> what was I saying? Yeah, the, the other reason I use two analog fours is that Although I've got a Digitact, I could have there with sampled drums, and that could be a dedicated drum machine, is the workflow, because each, each of the electron machines, or in fact, even if it was a different thing, like a circuit or whatever, um, having to switch between the different workflows on machines is 
sometimes takes you out of the moment. So the reason is having duplicates, one of the advantages is that, you know, the same menu system is appropriate to both, the, the same sequencer system, it's all the same. So, and I know with the OctaTrack, a lot of people have difficulties with that because it is very, um, very complex. And having to switch between, oh, okay, I'm on this machine now, this button does a different thing. Having two together is kind of cool. Anyway, back to this chord sound. Uh, one of the other tricks I mentioned was filtering. So this is on a um, high pass filter, so it only lets high frequencies through and I can control that. The nice thing with this is a bit like when you're on a, when you're doing a final mix on a desk. You're often giving each of the sounds, whether it's drums or bass or guitars or whatever, and different synths, their own little frequency spectrum. So having these filters allows me to, for example, give this chord a nice um, frequency space of its own without going too low and interfering with the, the bass. Let's turn the bass up. So it's sort of nicely separated. Existence by making the lower uh, frequency point higher than the high frequency point so the two can overlap. Um, giving the um, sounds a bit of colour is important so I often use a couple of the LFOs to modulate, modulate the, um, the frequency, use a sine wave. fast so I'm just going to slow that down and I'm going to do the same trick now that I did on the bass so you can hear that pulsing bass which is an LFO so let's do the same with this chord on track one here um, so LFO volume Change the chord. 
looks like I changed it to 16 or more. Might do that later. Um, what am I doing? Oh yeah, I just want to change up the play of the drum beat a bit. Bring some uh, hi hats in just to give you some rhythm. here and sound locks of course which everyone's familiar with so let's do that chordal thing again so that's um drum track I generally can just pull it in and out on a mute so pressing the function key and then turning the track off uh, for the bass like I said before I have to that's quite a meaty a lot of bass in there I'll have to look at that so it allows me to do a breakdown and again you can play over the top of these or switch the track off of course And if it's got enough notes, it will allow you to play over the top of the chordal progression. Um, so other sounds. At the moment, I'm only using three of the eight tracks. So on track one here, sorry, I've got the microphone so close to the side of the little thing here. Oh, by the way, this is a little, little new case I built just for these two which is kind of, uh, took me a couple of hours to make it. It's pretty solid. Um, so of the eight tracks, I'm using one track for drums at the moment. Um, track one here I'm using for the, those chords. And I've got a bass on that one. So I could start to set up some other tracks to play um, along with this sort of backing. I've, um, I'm actually going to load in one of my favourite presets, which is called Lead Synth, or Lead Synth, what's it called? Uh, da, 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 da. I don't remember where some of these things are. I should load them into a kit, which I... Oh, Lead, lead Free, Lead Free. Uh, so... The other advantage of two analog fours is, of course, I can just turn that uh, sequence off. I can play chords on one of them and play a solo on the other. And actually, using LFOs like this, you have got the option of doing non-beat um, type stuff altogether. Oh, thanks, Bill. I presume you're talking about the case and not not me. These silly headphones on under the hat. Um, sorry, once you've got these infinite release, I'll get that word right, um, used on the LFOs, you can do this sort of thing, which is so the, the um, sequence is not running at all. And change the sound. A bit more um, tempo on that filtering. A bit too much bass on that uh, chord sound. Take the um, LFO filtering off on the chords altogether. Something a bit more like that. We have a bit of um, bit of effect on, a bit of panning, and then we're into sort of a nice ambient ambient thing we can do, of course. Oh yeah, we can slow the tempo of the LFO down, of course. So. you 
wanted something a bit slower. So I think the destination there is uh, filter 2 frequency, so I'm going to change it to filter 1 frequency. A little less effect. And now we've got the same thing, so I can change the chords on here. Again, the sequencing is not running. solos I've shown before you can switch them into art mode and just turning it on now perhaps a slowish arp going at this um, this rate let's just turn it up you can do cross LFO rhythms and um, just stop it completely so for example again no sequencer so that's one thing if I play the next step slightly out of time but on, on a semi-quaver beat. Um, you can create some of the internal rhythms and structure. And then if you're super clever on the infinite release bass. So it's just purely, purely the LFOs working together. And it gets sort of complicated if I want to get them working together. I suppose the advantage is you're just hitting the two simps at the same time. Um, sometimes you can start them, for example, if you bring the beat, let's get sequences going. Just turn track three off. Um, so that's in time because it was triggered initially and then I turned the sequencer off. But you, of course, you can get the LFO things happening. Uh, the chordal 
whole track here is just uh, playing by itself. I mean, it's not sequenced in any way. It's a little bit more frequency on that. Yeah, it's a. There's not many kicks I set up on the analog four. That's one of the, um, this is responding to Bill, it's one of the go-to ones, not two in your face. Um, right, so sequences, uh, just a recap of where we are. So this, this is um, uh, Bill, yeah, electron workflow. Um, I think, like I said earlier, if you caught that, it was um, having duplicate ones, it's primarily you don't have to, because I've got the did. Digitact, and um, that is a s completely sort of separate workflow because it's sort of eight sample tracks and then eight MIDI tracks, and the way you sample and, uh, and various other things are completely different from these guys. Uh, the model cycles is kind of similar on the sequencer. The sequencer side is, is kind of similar, but the sound design and everything else is different. And I mentioned the octa track, but having you know getting familiar, very familiar with one of them. And then duplicating it has its um, merits. Because that's what I'm after. So just to recap, we've got chords on track one. Um, some drums which change all the time on track four on this one. We've got a bass on here. Nothing else. So we've still got, only got three tracks going there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we had a solo designated on track one up here. Um, so let's get a sequence going. Some kind of sequence. And... Um, Let's try. So track two here. Um, the thing with sequences is it's often good, or it makes sense to put them in when things are running, so you can choose something that's appropriate. Because remember, the the whole point of all of this is I'm not making a um, a track that's going to be um, recorded into a door and then mixed and chopped up and so on. This is going to this is primarily for live performance. So I'm looking to set up things that are going to work together. And um, the way you do that, of course, is, is to have something running. So let's um, set up a, a sort of... Uh, probably not that one. Just a basic beat, just to keep us um, on track. I'll leave this one running this time, because this is just a standard. Uh, just a variation on this eighth step. I'll just put a, um, a probability drum, just to give a bit of variation. You can hear it there, so I'm just going to make the probability of that like 50%, so half the time it won't play, half the time it will. But randomly, so it's not. I think, oh, that's too loud. Get there, bring the bass back in. I turn the track on. A bit too much squelchiness on that one. I just want it in the background for the moment. So this is primarily just to set a sequence up. Keeping an eye on the levels. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yeah, the chordal thing. Might put this on an auto pan. At the moment it's just panned into the middle. So on the same... Um, same LFO. No, on a different LFO actually. I'm going to put this onto a, um, a pan at a different speed. So it's just moving around the stereo field. And I'll often do this as I'm setting up the track. So hopefully that's moving around in the stereo field. The chords. sequencing. So on track two here, um, I've got the length of track two set to 16. I, I want something slightly off beat, so I often use 7-8, um, so I'm just going to reset that to 14 steps. So I'm now going to play in a, let's just play a random seven step thing. Oh, 
Oh, I forgot. Because this is in poly mode, we're getting the situation now where this will be note stealing. As I press, press a second one in, it will actually go into poly. So sometimes best to just delete the sequence and then try again. Fine, so I'll get to something. Favourite knob tuner. Which one's that? Oh, my favourite knob turner. That's me, is it? I'm oh, still in the mirror. Um, what was I going to do here? Oh yeah, the other... The, so with this sequence, let's just uh, concentrate on that. I'll turn the bass down. I've got some auto panning going on it. I could put some... Uh, fast LFO on this as well because it's triggered. I thought, let's see what that sounds like. So you're now getting that doubling up effect. Just kind of cool. Should work for well the bass. And I hope I'm doing more than not turning because I'm actually playing things. Um, Obviously, I could have, where's my keyboard? I could have keyboards here and acoustic instruments, but I'm just demonstrating two standalone units today, which does involve a lot of knob turning, because I'm, that's what I'm sort of presenting, I hope. Uh, what was I going to do? So, the sequence. It's a bit um, high frequency, that one, so I'm going to drop it back a touch. Might add a sub bass to it on the second oscillator. Tuning across the oscillators. And I could put probability on the whole track. So let's see what that sounds like. So I've got 66% probability that a note will play, and it's random, it's not any order. And because it's in 7 8 as well, that's going to give me quite a bit of variation. And sequences come alive when they're locked like this you do some root changes to the chords. Let's bring in the, um, the actual chords. site if you're into modular called Mod Wiggler. I think Modular Wiggling. So a lot of people. Uh, there's a great 
forums, finding out things about modular, but they have um, sections on other instruments as well. So it's not just twiddling or turning, it's wiggling as well. So one sequence. Um, something a bit rhythmic now, I'm just thinking in terms of the structure of this. Sorry, not the structure, but the arrangement um, to have something rhythmic. So on track three here, I think I'm going to go noise. So let's um, use the LFOs again. No, I might use an alternate sequence, and I'm going to generate a noise from that, as in um, white noise. So. so let's put something really basic in for the moment. I think this is on 16 steps. I'm going to make it 10 steps, so it's um, only five, like a 5 4 thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, just repeating. Just check that. Oh, in fact, um, no, it should work. What happened there? Do, do, do. I think I got rid of the sequence there. Ah, one of the joys of <coughs> Electron, I did actually clear the whole pattern there. It doesn't matter, I mean, it's only, I didn't clear the sounds, so it just involves putting them back in again quickly. chords back in. Passing notes. 
So when I do do a chord change, uh, the sequence will still work with it. Kind of. Uh, let's check the sound of that. So I turn the drums off, turn that chord or sequencer down. And second oscillator. Frequency modulation. And the most important thing with these sequences is to pan them appropriately. I've probably got an auto pan on, but we've got. Oh, my headphones are all the way around. So I'm making sure. Let's just turn them actually. Helps me if I've got the stereo configuration the right thing. And I've got this cable sticking down. Um, so yeah, there's two sequences here. Let's turn the bass off. We've got a little sequence on track two here. Pan. Make sure it's panned differently. I think there's an auto pan on that one, which doesn't help. So track two is pan to the left. And that one is pan to the right. And this is just filling out the stereo field, of course. Put the bass back in. sequences. kind of have to remember where they are. Um, I think that's easy. Yeah, I've got them both on track two. That's not just by accident, really. And track three is not being used on here. Might use this as a, um, just for the sake of time, a bit of a noise thing. I mentioned this before. So I'm just going to enter in a five-step thing. But rather than use an oscillator, I'm going to turn it into a noise track, which of course you need to control with the envelope. And I can do some clever things with this, it's just to provide um, something a bit later where I can go from the noise back to an oscillator, and I'll show you what that means. Let's turn everything off. Not too keen on those sequences, so I might change those later. So this is being sequenced, that noise. I just want to check, get it nice and um, crisp from an attack perspective. Uh -huh. Another schoolboy error there, adjusting the wrong sound. So I was actually adjusting Interesting the sequence there. Get that back to something normal. So this one, yeah, there's um, this one is a bit snappier on that uh, noise. Definitely auto panning on this one. It's a bit faster. And again, this one I could put on a volume um, volume LFO to give it some variation. But I'm actually going to do it on the sequence. So I'm just going to choose the four notes in between here. And then put a probability on them, so occasionally you'll get those fast passing notes. Not all the time though. And this will give you a sort of endless variation in the um, in the sequence. I'm just setting it to sort of say 33%. 
percent. Uh, the interesting thing is, what is this doing from an oscillator perspective? Because at the moment, the oscillators are turned down on track three here. I'll call a ribbon thing. Let's turn up the hi hats so you can hear them in relation to that. So just looking at here in the rhythm at the moment. So track three is this noise, but what happens when we bring in an oscillator? So again, this is just on track three. I could turn everything else off. So I've basically got a noise there, which I can bring in an oscillator. I could even tune oscillator two on this one to a sub sound. So we get suddenly very Tangerine Dream. The thing is, once these are set up, I can then go into sort of performance mode, which I hope I'll be doing in a bit. What time are you up to? 52. Oh, I've got a long left. I kind of do in an hour <coughs> setup and answering any questions, and then an hour performance. So I've nearly used all the tracks up. I think I've still got track four of this one left. But this is kind of cool, so I can bring in a nice high sequence and because I've got these alternating notes on a probability I might set it a bit lower actually it's kind of cool and choose a different waveform might just extend the decay slightly on that one I can actually do that in the performance, actually. So, I mean, but that make a nice um, turn the drums off. Make might make a nice little intro type thing. Bit of a nice reverb on it. So remember that was um, noise and the oscillator. I can turn the oscillator off and then just pull the filter up to bring in the noise. So it makes a nice breakdown, particularly if you've got um, something going on the rhythm track. I'll just change the, that's the bass drum to something a bit more. So all the time I'm thinking from an arrangement perspective as I'm setting this up. Excuse me, I'm gonna find um, an alternate bass drum. Just use that one for now, a bit more sort of techno -y. Um, What was I saying? All the time thinking of how all this is gonna to work together in a performance mode. Um, the other thing with electron sequencing particularly is um, um, uh, trigs on the sequence. I'm not going to extend this to 16 or more for the moment, I'm just going to keep it simple. But um, a lot of electron stuff you hear, this type of thing of course, where this is playing an offbeat because it's slotted in between like a drum track. Um, so one thing I need to do is sound design this thing that's going to go in between. So I'm going to create um, a nice rhythmic thing and to do this probably turn off the drum track you can hear the um this uh noise thing is actually stealing some of the notes so i'm going to make it short so it's not so it's not stealing as much so what i want this to be is like a stab chord thing so really short to make sure I'm designing the sound designing the right thing here. Same with the uh, filter envelope, nice and short. So this is like I said gonna go offbeat in between the 
in between the drums. Uh, two oscillators. Get a detune. Um, I'm going to make it low pass so it's a bit more of a I'm going to add a fifth, I think. Right, I'll explain what all that was about. On track four, which is now uh, the drums, I just wanted to quickly sound design a basic thing to put on an offbeat chord thing, which I just did. So now it's playing on four. I could play a different note on, on um, six. So then you've got these sort of immediate sort of grooves that you can bring in and out when you want actually manually so like step two step four g and you could do a super high one on that last step if you wanted and of course bringing in the sequences when you need them playing some manual chords it's turned up So I'm going to put them back on. Um, so there's a bit of voice stealing going on there, which um, I, I ideally should have put a sort of offbeat one on this one because it's not voice stealing. Yeah, Jeff, um, just talking about the um, parameter lock type things or the tricks. So if you go to track four again, you can see. Um, I suppose that's one of the reasons I use a limited step length is that you suddenly don't... So for all those notes, for example, I know they're on every alternate one, I can just switch them all off like this. Okay, you've lost them. So another alternate... Let's just put one note for the moment. Let's just say choose these middle two. Um, another way of turning off, you know where they are, you can just turn down the, as a parameter, lock just the volume for those two steps. So as you kind of, a little later on in a performance, if you want to do a bit of a build, and you've broken down to just that, you know there's something going on on four and six in this case, so you can just turn up the amp. Bit of reverb, a bit more delay. Uh, bring the volume up of one of the sequences. And I know there's another sequence, I think, on track two here. And again, I can turn those off beats off again just by holding them. That's if I want to keep them. I don't like this sequence up here, I'm going to fix that in a minute. Um, if you, you know, sometimes you don't like them, so you just take them off completely and then just re-enter them, which is... And you can actually do some note changes as you're playing as well. Oh, 
go, that sequence. Let's get rid of the offbeats. This sequence, uh, that's way too fast. Yeah. So let's just bring that LFO down again. Turn the volume down. So this sequence wasn't doing it for me. Probably the notes, the sound is not ideal either. It's got some probability on it. So one thing you do when you re-enter the... Um, oh no, it's fine. One thing you do when you need to re-enter a sequence is just check things like probability, because sometimes you'll be entering in... entering in a, um, another sequence, and then you'll wonder why some of the notes aren't sounding. It's actually because you've got a probability set on the track. So let's see if we can make this better. I'll leave this track three just going as a metronome. In fact, I don't want it that fast. I just want it half speed. It's terrible. Half speed, I said. Pay attention, guy. like that and let the delay do the because I've got a faster sequence going on this side it's kind of cool Said these LFO triggered chords, you have to um, really uh, turn the track volume down because they're on infinite release. Uh, in this, in my case, <coughs> just want to fix this sound. Not really happy. It's on a bit of a bandpass filter at the moment. So probably want to make it a bit less in your face. A bit more sustain, I think, and a bit more release. Just something a bit more gentle, I think, a bit more fluty. Just detuning. Might separate the oscillators by an octave. Just get rid of that uh, track three down here. So now this gives me the opportunity if I start with something on this one. Might change the notes of that one.
great. Bit of rhythm, just let me know what I'm doing. So this, um, I'm now thinking, how's this going to start? Or what sort of things can I do? Um, so that <clears throat> is a bit too rhythmic. So I'm after something gentle to start. Um, so like some chords. So I can adjust the LFO speeds on the fly. So I can have some nice cross rhythms going. All the time, because you've got this arrangement, rather than locking yourself into something from a performance perspective, you can <coughs> just decide on... How are you doing, Grogu? You can decide on which direction you want to start. So, um, and again, filtering is super important. So that sequence is kind of nice. It's a little bit clicky, so I'm just going to change the... the envelope on that, and turn down the filter envelope, so it's more or less... So something nice and gentle like that. I'm just adding it on this track at the moment. Nice way to bring in a little solo up here. When I'm in performance mode as well, another trick. Hello bots, usually from Russia. Not sure why the bots attach themselves to chats on YouTube. Is it purely so that Google gives them some, some Google points? Anyway, so that they can infiltrate other areas. I'm sure they're not going to actually hack into YouTube. Anyway. So you can see I've got all that rhythmic stuff and bass lines and chords and everything all in the background here. And now I've got um, the ability to, to go small. A bit more um, knob turning here. Not musical at all, at all, it's just turning knobs. <laughs> I'm being silly. And the other nice thing, and I think I mentioned this last week or the week before with the SQ1s when I was triggering, is that I could be soloing up here like with the right hand, and that chordal sound, for instance, be adjusting the filter. Great contribution there, the old helmet. Um, so doing the quiet reverby thing is is kind of easy. So <coughs> as we're getting um, no questions, just ridiculous uh, comments from uh, the old helmet. Um, probably go into a sort of performance. Let's just see, just as a little test. Oh yeah, Ryan, don't worry about it. It was um, I I know my own abilities musically. It was um, it's just sometimes I think I put up like a modular, and I get occasional comments from people going, "Oh, you're not a proper musician," and all that sort of thing, and it. It's uh, interesting their perspective, and they've probably learnt three or four guitar chords or something. Anyway, what was I doing? What have I got going here? 
yeah so let's do a little performance and again no questions just bots and silly comments about strap-ons so I'm going to switch into um, the speaker power you probably can see the speakers here it allows me to if you're mixing on headphones it's great but you do tend to um, mix in a well the, the you can hear a lot of detail which people often can't through speakers so I prefer to mix through the air if you like and um, so it just means switching off my headphones and microphone and going to speaker power so again see you on the other side I'll put um, chapter markers in I've gone a bit over in describing this but hopefully it was useful the um, description of how I sort of set up a performance I'd normally to be honest do that in 15 20 minutes and even when I'm out on a cliff edge or something I'll quickly set those up from scratch just deciding or oh, it's part of the process for me deciding on what's going to be um, what's going to be in the performance and what things I need at my disposal um, and often I'll, I'll do things from scratch anyway I think there's a track free here I always like to leave a track free on any setup or even more so that if the urge takes me and I want to go into something more abstract and weird which I could go crazy with this um, I can just use another track for something else so hopefully uh, yeah you got some use out of that as a um, as a sort of arranging producing type perspective um, the musically it sort of can go in any direction that's part of the fun as well we can um, this may go into EDM style it might go Berlin-y can obviously go into a serious ambient and that type of thing really just that's part of the joy of using these sort of setups is you're not limited to just doing one type of music of course it's super easy to just get a four to the floor going and then just do occasional little blips and blops over the top and um, that's the easy way around but um, yeah okay so thanks Battle and Bill and if you find this useful subscribe and like I've uh, already got 20 likes that's pretty cool and um, so off we go I'll just uh, get rid of the mic and uh, let's set something going